Okay. Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. So I was wondering, a great conversations uh, between our um, break there. Learned a lot about merging knowledge strategies and things like that, so thank you. Sounds like there's an awful lot going on in, co in this country around recovery. Congratulations, it's very exciting. I'm learning. So um, are there any uh, final comments or thoughts from our first session that we should wrap up before moving forward? All right, good. Um, so in this second lecture, I want to continue to talk about this theme of building tools that can be used in vivo or in the workplace itself, tools that in and through the use of them begin to teach recovery-oriented principles. Okay, so that's sort of the radical notion that I've got over all of these years of trying to train and carry the good news that recovery is real. And again, um, uh, this is another way that I've grappled with that uh, insight. So as I said earlier, a lot of times I'll just get asked to speak at various conferences and then I pe ask people, well, what would you like me to discuss? And they say, well, we really like you to say something inspirational. And that's a very beautiful thing, right? I mean, to be asked to do that. Unfortunately, I, do, I don't have like a switch that I can, you know, click to become inspirational. Um, however, um, I kind of get what people mean. They want me to share my story, the hope that I carry for recovery, and that's a beautiful thing. And as I mentioned, um, that very often people are in the audience who will feel inspired by that uh, address or by that talk um, and have an idea and feel emboldened to go forward to the place where they work and uh, try to affect change and to work differently. And that's a beautiful thing. In fact, there were some people in the room who talked to me during the break here today who mentioned that things like papers and videotaped lectures and live lectures inspired them earlier on in their career um, and that helped them, embolden them to, to be able to um, uh, be pioneers uh, and, and champions of recovery in, in country. And I agree that that's a beautiful thing. It's just really hard. And the odds are when you go back from an inspirational talk into the culture, culture is an incredibly powerful yet difficult to tame beast. It is really something. The culture of an organization. You can go into one organization, say one hostel or a group home setting or supported living setting, and the place is on fire about recovery. And you go in another one and you feel like you're back in an inpatient unit. And you're like, how can these two things be so different when both of them get the same funding, have to hire staff from the same pool of, what's the differential around culture? And I tell you, if there's one thing I could do, it would be to bottle whatever that differential around culture is and have the formula for creating recovery culture. Now that's, that's something I would love to do. Instead, as I mentioned, what I've settled on is trying to build tools. Um, you know, uh, one of the factors that, you know, is on my mind, as I say, um, build tools, um, is the fact that people, there's a huge difference between learning something intellectually, learning something theoretically, learning something in principle, and then being able to do something different day in and day out and day in and day out, right? What do I do different, right? What do I do differently? So uh, what I decided to do um, was to cogitate on this old saying, and this is one of these quotes that's sort of taken on a life of its own and nobody quite knows anymore where it quite came from but you've all probably seen some version of this quote. And when we think about systems analysis, including the analysis of mental health systems and healthcare delivery systems, I think this quote really is worth reflecting on, that every system is perfectly designed to get exactly 
the results that it's getting. And what results do we want? And how are we going to redesign systems to reliably get those results? So if our system, as is in the United States, is perfectly designed to get exactly the result of high recidivism after a first episode of psychosis, how can we change that system to change that outcome, right? So a system is designed to get exactly the outcomes um, that it's getting. And then we be, uh, have this interesting question of how can we think about redesigning systems such that we change the outcomes that we're getting? It's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. And it's a question that's a little bit different than asking how do we teach people recovery. But it can be used, I think, in the same way. So um, I feel I had, in my own experience, uh, as I mentioned, um, was drugged with incredibly high doses of antipsychotic medications for many years. I'll be talking a little bit more about this um, in my talk at the conference tomorrow. Um, and so I knew for myself that when psychiatry and psychiatric nursing are over here doing their own thing, right? And putting people under very high dosage of medication to the point where people are nodding out and sleeping during the day and unable to attend, or their hands, uh, have, they have the Parkinsonism going with the hands, um, so that even if they um, uh, wanted to work on a car engine, they can't work on a car engine. That what's happening in that psychiatric care consultation where medications are prescribed, okay, is key because how are we going to do rehabilitation work, recovery-oriented rehabilitation work, when a person's hand is doing this and they can't go back to work as an auto mechanic? And we go back to the doctor and we say, but, but, but. The doctor said, no, this is necessary. If we, if we back off the meds, symptoms return. We must have, we have to have psychiatry on board with recovery transformation. Now, good luck with that, <laughs> right? That's a big ticket. But that's the one I'm interested in disrupting. So what I want to do, I, I, I'm a believer in disrupting systems and transforming them. I don't want to just disrupt and create chaos. I want to disrupt and transform. And my friends, the notion of recovery is powerfully disruptive. It's powerfully disruptive. And it is why there is such resistance to it. So for instance, in the area of psychiatry, what um, does, um, uh, what gets disrupted by the idea of recovery? Well, first of all, that people can get well even after a diagnosis of serious mental illness. That in itself is profoundly disrupted. And it's disruptive of many, many things that, as you know, uh, psychiatrists have been trained in and nurses have been trained in, and for that matter, psychologists and many social workers have been trained to believe this is not so, okay? Um, and what else uh, does it disrupt? Well, that, that somehow um, uh, the person has uh, uh, the idea that a person could exercise choice and have a psychotic di a diagnosis of psychosis is disruptive. Like recovery said, choice and a voice, and let people have a say in their care. Well, they're crazy. They can't have a, a say in their care. They have a brain disease. They can't have a say in their care, right? It disrupts that whole idea. And so what happens in the face of that disruption is that good, caring practitioners are like, so what am I supposed to do? I was trained to do this. Are you saying that my training is irrelevant? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Are you saying that my training is obsolete? I went to the finest universities. I, I, so that's not the way to go about it, right? We know that recovery, the idea of people becoming self-determining, et cetera, is a very disruptive notion. So of course we encounter resistance. How do we get past it? And I've learned that the answer is not lecturing. <laughs> and the answer is not just 
presenting a lot of research. Because once you present all the research studies, then comes, but that's not true for my patients, <laughs> right? People want to see it with their own eyes. They want to see that there's this other way that I work that changes the patients that I'm working with and their responses to care. That seems to be the ticket. <laughs> and whatever it is we're going to do has to be doable within the public mental health system, which is where my efforts are. I don't work in the private sector. I work in the public. So I took on, I decided to take on some time ago. I said, until psychiatry gets disrupted and transformed, we're not going to get as far as we want to get with rehabilitation and recovery. Because if you're drugging me so bad that my hands are shaking and I can't work on an engine, what good does rehab do me if I can't, right? There needs to be <laughs> a connection. So here's the standard medication visit. Here's the system, okay? Here's the system. So people come in and they check in with the receptionist. This is the way it works in the United States. And then they wait. And we call them waiting areas for a reason, because you wait, right? Then I get to see the doctor. And when I'm with the doctor, research has actually shown that between when the doctor says, Pat, how are you doing? And I respond, I have 18 seconds, 18 seconds to respond. Because in the United States, a government reimbursable, health system reimbursable business through Medicaid is 15 minutes, maybe 20. 15 to 20 minutes. Same? Okay. There you go. All right. All righty then. <laughs> All right, so good luck. How are you doing, Pat? Well, I think that, oh, time, we gotta get on to my questions. <laughs> right? Honestly, that's real data. Um, and so then, because a physician needs to be able to ask a whole series of assessment questions in order to make the prescription and get the paperwork done and read the labs, and there's about 17 different uh, demands that need to be met during that 15 minute consultation. So I end up answering questions. Any side effects? Nope, good. Uh, how you doing, a little bit better? Yep, a little bit better, okay. <laughs> then I prescribe treatment, and then I'm out of there. Right, I check out. This is the system that reliably and perfectly gets the results that we get in the United States, which include that about half the people leaving hospitals never come back. This all happens in the outpatient clinics too, the clinical care sector. That um, the rates of not using medication as prescribed, it's around half of folks prescribed don't use it, and high recidivism and return to hospital. That's the system that does it. Okay, so I said to myself, what could I do to disrupt this system. What could I do to disrupt this system and transform it to a recovery-oriented approach? Hmm. <laughs> Did I get out and lecture to psychiatrists about the importance of shared decision-making, recovery, and self-determination around medications? No. <laughs> I wouldn't waste my breath, right? It wouldn't work, right? No, I, I just gave up trying to do that. It's not, instead, is I built and I re-engineered a new system. And I call this the common ground visit, okay? So, let me tell you what happens in a common ground visit. First of all, people check in. And then we get rid of the waiting room. No more waiting room. Instead of coming in and sitting in a chair waiting, we say, in today's healthcare environment, there is no time for waiting in waiting rooms. In today's healthcare environment, what we need to do is to get prepared to participate, prepared to participate in making critically important health decisions with my prescriber, okay? So in the common ground approach, in the common ground, the person-centered visit, 
What we do is people arrive at the outpatient clinic, they check in with the receptionist, and they are greeted by a peer support worker, a person with the lived experience of recovery, who welcomes people to what we call a decision support center. And in a decision support center, I can get peer support and technology-enabled peer support in order uh, to prepare to participate in making very important decisions with my psychiatrist about my next steps in my treatment, right? So let me show you what decision support centers look like. Over the course of 12 days, we visited 13 peer-run decision support centers in 13 mental health centers across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We drove over 1,008 miles on our journey. We traversed the state from remote rural areas through beautiful farmlands and Amish country, up winding roads into the Pocono and Allegheny Mountains. I learned that Common Ground is so much more than software. It's an entire program that promotes and integrates team-based care. No silos. Team-based care means no silos. Common Ground makes the voice and choice of the individual the epicenter around which all care efforts are coordinated. Of course, I also met remarkable, inspiring, heroic, innovative peer specialists. Peer specialists rock. They are the real disruptive innovators. They disrupt the myth of chronicity because they're living in recovery and share their lived experience with folks coming to the Decision Support Center, which, by the way, is pretty much everyone coming for services. And that means that nearly everyone coming for services gets to hear the good news that recovery is real. They are reaching tens of thousands of peers with the disruptive know-how to support healing, self-discovery, and recovery. I learned so much from you guys. Thank you. We sure were busy, and we got pretty tired during our 12-day road trip. But it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience that I'll never forget. I also personally want to thank each of you for opening up your hearts and your doors for us to visit and learn from you. Together, we are changing the world so that more people can recover after a diagnosis of mental illness. Thanks for all you do. So decision support centers, peer-run decision support centers replace the waiting area. So that means that every single person, oh me, <laughs> It means that every single person coming in for mental health services, number one, gets to hear the good news that recovery is real and to meet people themselves in recovery. That's strategic, that's systemic, that's smart. That's me disrupting the system, okay? I was isolated. I was told, take your medicine. I, never, I was told there was no such thing as recovery. I disrupted that by creating a peer-run decision support center. They're funded because peers can bill in the United States, bill through Medicaid. So peers, the peers that you saw working here, they can um, bill for every single visit. So a person comes in, they meet with the peer specialist at the decision support center. They learn about recovery from the peer specialist. But importantly, they do a couple of more things, okay? Here's what else they do. When at the decision support center, they're helped to discover personal medicine. Every single person coming to the mental health center has the opportunity to discover their own unique personal medicine. What am I up to with that? Why did I disrupt the system that way? And the reason is because I didn't want people to go through what I went through. It took me years to figure out and to stumble into the fact I could help myself. In a common ground decision support center, people can come into clinic before they see their psychiatrist and be able to learn that they can help themselves and that the answers 
sometimes lie within, not always, on Dr. Google. <laughs> right? We have the answers within. So we learn about personal medicine. And I shared just a touch about that. Um, but personal medicine, as we've discussed, are the things that I do to be well. And here at the Decision Support Center, you see a couple of peers helping people discover personal medicine. And we even keep some personal medicine cards available to people in little files. <clears throat> when people discover their personal medicine, the things I do to be well, they enter it into the computer program. Okay, So it's all going into a computer program. Watch what happens next. The next thing that happens in a decision support center is a peer supporter, a peer specialist, helps me <clears throat> or supports me in writing what we call a power statement. These are my favorite things, these power statements. They are awesome. What is a power statement? A power statement is a powerful statement that does three things. It introduces me as a person, not a patient. Secondly, it says what matters to me and how I want treatment to help. And the third thing a power statement does is it invites my doctor to work with me on a plan to get to what matters to me, to get to my goal for my treatment. Is that cool or what? So here's Mary. Mary. Her personal medicine, the most, she, she was struggling with um, uh, major depressive disorder with psychosis. And the most important thing in Mary's life, <clears throat> the thing that mattered to her most was being a good mom to that beautiful baby, okay? She was on so much medication that she was sleeping through the baby's feedings and the state was threatening to come in and take that baby away because she couldn't care for the baby. But she was on such heavy doses of antipsychotics and, and uh, uh, antidepressants that made her even more somnolent, she was unable to be wakeful. What was happening in that situation is that what I call pill medicine, the medication, was interfering with her personal medicine. And when pill medicine interferes with personal medicine, we can't recover. We can't recover. We needed to help Mary and her psychiatrist find the right balance between her personal medicine, being a good mom. Being a good mom is a powerful antidepressant, isn't it? It's a powerful antidepressant. And when medication wipes out the antidepressant properties of being a good mom, treatment fails. Certainly recovery fails. So a power statement is going to help Mary, and it did. Here's her power statement that goes into the computer program. The most important thing in my life is being a good mom to my baby. Now, this is what the psychiatrist is going to read, okay, the minute I come in the office. That is my personal medicine, and it helps me stay out of psychosis. I want you to work with me to find medicine that will help me pay attention to my baby, not my voices, so I can be a good mom. What I love about power statement, I could go on about these things, I, they're wonderful. And what I love about them is that they're an N of one study. In other words, I can administer a PANS, a positive and negative symptom assessment scale to Mary, and find that when she's on these heavy doses of antipsychotic medication that wipe out her capacity to be a good mom, that her positive symptoms and her negative symptoms are decreased. Success, right? wrong. Because if, as a consequence of that heavy dosing, she cannot be a good mom, treatment has failed, and I don't care if her PAN score is coming down. Treatment has failed. It's an N of one study. How will I know if treatment is effective for Mary? If she is mothering that child. Okay? That's the power of power statements. Power statements are entered into the computer program with the support from peer specialists, okay? Next, decision support. Decision support means that peer specialists are trained to support people in exploring my online recovery library to get information. So 
If I'm a young man uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia and I am thinking about having children and I'm wondering, you know, will I pass on bad genes to my child if I should have a baby with my partner? I, I need to know more about that. Of course we need to talk to the doctor about that. Right? That's a very important decision, not just a medical decision, a very personal decision. But that requires medical consult. But how can I prepare to have the conversation? I could learn more. So I have in the computer program a whole library of information, including getting a, a, a specialist in women's health and reproduction, to talk, and who's also a psychiatrist, uh, to talk in very plain English about the pros and cons, risks and benefits of using medications during pregnancy, just really basic stuff, so I can go in and have the conversation. Decision support. What if I'm thinking about trying for a job, but I'm scared of relapsing? Oh, we've got videos of people who have returned to work. You want to see someone who went back to being an engineer? Here you go. And you can watch it. Decision support. It doesn't mean that as a peer specialist, I decide for you. And it doesn't mean that I say, never talk to your doctor, never talk to your therapist. No. It means here's information that will help you prepare to participate in a conversation. OK? So here's an example of the recovery library. And then people create a health report. <clears throat> when I create a, <coughs> a health report, I answer questions about how I'm doing since my last visit, right? I can show you kind of what it looks like here. How I've been doing since my last visit. People use a touch screen. Sometimes they use an iPad or a tablet. Um, and that's a sense of what my health report actually looks like when it prints out at the end. But I say something about <coughs> how I've been doing since my last appointment. Talk about how I've been using or not using my medication since my last appointment. I say something about any concerns I have about unwanted effects from the drugs. Okay. I say what my goal is for this particular meeting. But importantly, at the very beginning of the health report is my power statement, which is the guiding light of all my treatment. That's the very first thing. And that's followed by my personal medicine. Have I been using my personal medicine since my last visit? Are you feeling the disruption here? In a meeting in which typically we get 15 minutes and I get 18 seconds to say how I'm doing, my health report has summarized my thinking about how I'm doing and what my concerns are so that my psychiatric care team can see that before I even walk in the room. These are numeric ratings, right? And, okay. So, That's my health report. And then, having created my health report, I go in and I talk to my psychiatrist. So this is Eddie and Dr. Leeson on the right. And here's an example. After looking at my health report, after answering the questions, after Dr. Leeson has been able to move through his agenda, which is also important, together we write or agree on a shared decision about the next step in treatment. So on this um, shared decision for Eddie, they wrote, we agree that between now and my next appointment, I will track my side effects using the side effects calendar and bring that to my next appointment. In other words, that's something that I am going to do between now and my next appointment to support my recovery. Another example of a shared decision might be, we agree that between now and my next appointment, I will um, use the new antidepressant I will also get off the bus one stop early because exercise is an antidepressant too for me. In other words, it's not just enough to say I will use my meds as prescribed. That's not the shared decision. Shared decision may involve using meds, yes, but what else are you going to do besides swallow pills? What are you going to do? And I can walk out the door with that shared decision, right? Very important, right? So I can take that shared decision 
and any information I got at the Peer Run Decision Support Center and actually take that out into my world with me. Because where does recovery happen? It does not happen in the office. That's really important. And I think sometimes clinicians can lose sight of that. Recovery doesn't happen in the office. Recovery happens in the context of my own life. And until I start doing things differently in my life, then I'm not going to get well. Right? Importantly, though, the health report, my health report, also follows and goes to the center of the whole care team. So my therapist, my case manager, my residential worker, my family supporter, anyone who's got permissions in terms of my protected health information may see my health report and how I am doing. So for instance, my, clinic, my whole treatment team can take my um, power statement and make it the centerpiece of my care plan, okay? Can take my power statement and make it the center of my care plan, importantly, right? That my case manager can see that I say I'm really struggling again with those distressing voices. And then the case manager can go into the library in the computer program and find personal medicine cards to help me with those distressing voices, right? So this is a, a web-based application, of course. So what are the outcomes I get by disrupting the system in this way? Disrupting and then transforming. Well, what we have are, are data that supports that our ability to engage and activate people in their own self-care uh, is uh, improved. That we can, in uh, one large health system, using our system uh, gets lower emergency room and inpatient admissions. Uh, that people feel their ability to communicate with their psychiatric care staff um, increases. That concerns about medication use actually um, go down. So I, I'm, after using the pr program, after using it over a period of time, my concerns about the impact of medicine on my health go down. My concerns about side effects go down. And my belief that medications are helping go up through using the program. And one would hope by having better communication overall that um, it, it results in improved satisfaction with care. People are more satisfied with their psychiatric care. And that people, uh, in one study across uh, eight centers in New York State, found that, um, this was Molly Finnerty's study out of the Office of Mental Health in New York, uh, found increased medication adherence among fo folks diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia who are using the program. I'm no big fan of adherence per se, uh, but I know it's a big issue, return on investment for some groups. So those are the kind of outcomes uh, we're seeing. And in terms of where we're at, uh, you know, we've been doing uh, Common Ground since about 2008. And this is where we're currently working. So we're not just a prototype. Uh, we are out there. And, uh, and increasingly, we seem to be getting picked up by assertive community treatment teams. Um, who find it pretty valuable in working with folks with complex and high needs. Um, and we have won a bunch of awards, including, I found this interesting, the American Psychiatric Association gave us a big award for um, uh, a gold achievement award for um, innovation in psychiatric care. Um, and so, I use that as an example um, of what I mean by every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. And then to pose the question, if we're trying to teach recovery, one way to teach it is to disrupt an existing system for whom, uh, whose outcomes we do not like, right? And transform that system, it's a systems thinking to achieve a different outcome, right? So this is, a, I think, a powerful example of one way to think about doing that. So before we go into small group work, I'm wondering, does anybody have any clarifying questions for me about the program? Yeah.
So I think that good clinicians in general, whether social work, psychology, psychiatry, good clinicians do collaborative work with people and support people in decision making. So decision support is not a unique function of peer specialists. However, the work that peer specialists are doing with the tools that they have at their disposal is quite unique um, in the setting of common ground, right, of, of a, common, a clinic using common ground. Um, and my tools are not to be meant to be used only by peer specialists. For instance, in clinics that use the common ground approach and the common ground tools, um, uh, therapists doing DBT, uh, therapists doing CBT uh, are all using my recovery library as well. So these tools are meant, to, I call them bi-directional. They're meant to be used by individuals themselves with a peer supporter, but they're also available to be used by clinicians. So in many of our clinics, clinicians also know about personal medicine and are able to share personal medicine with the people that they're working with, for instance. Does that help at all? Um, very often what will happen is a social worker who's acting as a, th social workers can have many roles, right? <clears throat> so a social worker would refer a um, client to a peer run, the, the peer run decision support center for peer support regarding a particular decision where there wasn't enough time in the therapy session itself, for instance. So that the work of peer supporters can complement the work that's being done in more formal psychotherapy using these tools. Yeah, yeah. So um, people do it on an ongoing basis. And so our um, framework for this when we're working with a new clinic is to say, okay, this becomes our standard of care. We reject that first systems diagram, med visit, wait, doctor. We reject that. This is the way we, um, this is the standard we uphold. This is how we run med clinic. Now, if you come in and you say to a peer supporter, <coughs> look, <coughs> I don't want to do a health report today, but I do want to rework my power statement. Or I don't want to do a health report today, but I'd rather spend my time with you working on um, understanding this issue or, or that. <coughs> An example would be someone saying, I feel like I'm really over-medicated, and I want to know how I can talk to my doctor about that without seeming really ungrateful for the care my doctor's been giving me. And so together, the peer specialist and the individual can watch, for instance, a video I've created called, How Do I Know That I'm Over-Medicated? And it comes with a worksheet. And together, you pull that up on the computer, you watch that together, and you walk into your appointment with that worksheet. Doctor, I think I'm over-medicated, and here's why. Okay? So it can, you know, we say Common Ground is more than a software program. Common Ground's about the people that are using it. But the software program helps to structure the work. And that's what I mean by a tool that's happening in the care pathway. That term, care pathway, is really important, right? There's a pathway, whether we can see it or not, it might not be visible, but there is a pathway to care. Sometimes it's really fragmented. Sometimes it's kind of this deadening straight line, and sometimes <clears throat> it's a flexible line, but still, there are systems. So what I'm encouraging you is to think about systems, how to disrupt and transform. Yep.
it's extremely challenging. Um, you know, I think, for instance, you should ask me the question, why doesn't every single uh, psychiatric consultation that and mental health center in the entire United States employ my software and peer-run decision support centers? And the answer is for some organizations, it's too heavy a lift. It's too much. They just are like, they don't have the leadership in the organization to make it happen. I think that what we know from implementation science is that three things are important for actually implementing a new idea. And any, you know, it's really easy to do a pilot program. I refuse to do them. No more pilots. Don't waste your money. Because as soon as that funding dries up, the pilot evaporates, you know? So here's what we know, that starting is only the beginning. Then we have to sustain, and then we have to spread. And I'm proud to say we have large mental health centers, we have large managed care companies, we have large health care systems that not only started with the Common Ground program and are sustaining it, but are now spreading it further across their system. So that's always a good sign, right? But then there's that deeper question, what is this culture? And if I could bottle it, I would, I would because it's powerful. And so what we know from implementation science are three things. One, that it is critical that we have leadership. And it is amazing how rare, true, principled leadership is. What we have out there are people who are really good at following the money. Oh, we're doing integrated health now. Everything's, forget that recovery stuff. That was last year. Now it's integrated health, yeah. You know, it's not seeing any connection between integrated health and recovery, you know, any of that. And unfortunately, in many of the places where I touch down in my work, that's the kind of leadership I see. That uh, my job as a CEO, as the leader or part of a leadership team, is to make a financial bottom line for the organization. And we worry about quality of care afterwards, right? And so we lack principal leadership. So finding an organization with principal leadership, I think, is important. What constitutes principal leadership? I think it's a leadership that can see beyond the latest fad towards what really matters, which is people getting their lives back. And it's amazing that you don't always find that in the leadership role in organizations. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's out there, it's out there. Um, the other idea, thing that's very important is to recognize that leadership does not mean specifically a position of power. That there are many leaders in organizations who are what we call internal champions, who are like you guys, you may be in the belly of the beast, if you will, you may be in the organization, but you're agitating for that change, you want to see the change, you're disrupting, and you can be a leader too. That leadership is about what I do, not just the position that I hold. And recognizing, and we intentionally cultivate uh, uh, common ground champions in organizations who throughout the organization's history, uh, we've got a common ground site that was founded in um, March of, of 2008. That's a long time now, right? Still up and running and going. So leadership, principal leadership, and the training of supervisors who can supervise line staff, clinicians, peer specialists, in the practice, who know the practice inside and out, are the second key, this is from implementation science, to um, sustaining a practice over time. So I need to know that when I go into supervision, my, peer spe uh, my supervisor, I might be a social worker, and that my supervisor is going to ask, but what about the most recent health report? What, what did it say? Because if that's never mentioned in my, sup I'm not going to do it. It's another step. I have to log in. That's the second thing. Supervisors who know what they're doing and who um, adopt the practice and reinforce its effectiveness. And then the second is funding streams. You have to have funding streams aligned with the objectives and the practice that you're looking to promote and sustain over time. So for instance, I showed the little video of Common Ground and I forget how many sites it is. It's more now. I think we've got 20 sites, 26 sites in uh, Pennsylvania right now and have had them for a long time. Why? We're partnered with a managed care company with principal leadership, okay, that has said <coughs> it pays to have people get well <coughs> as a managed care company. It keeps us in business. Um, and so what they do is that they put um, 
uh, petition into the, the state legislature for a change in the code for payable dollars. And they got peer specialists working in decision support center a special billing code. And the billing code says that when I'm working with someone to do a health report, I can bill Medicaid for that. And what does that, wh why is that such a solution? It is a financial solution on a number of levels for these organizations. First of all, it pays the salary of the peer staff. Second, it takes the, um, it makes the medication clinic a profit center rather than a center for deficits. Med clinics are closing left and right in the United States because they are, um, they don't pay. Organizations lose money paying expensive psychiatrists for their time. This changes that equation for the provider. And these are real concerns. I mean, we've got to address this. So the three things, principal leadership, internal recovery champions, especially supervisors, and a funding stream to support, support the sustainability of the practice. And it has been of real interest to me to discover that a managed care company could be a partner. I always sort of thought of them as the, those guys. <laughs> uh, so yeah, wow, who would have thought? But when those stars align, there you've got the practice, it's being sustained, and there are incentives on a lot of levels to keep it going. <laughs> That's the ticket. And I'm, by the way, not the only one discovering that. I mean, this is coming out of, uh, it's Bob Drake and the folks at Dartmouth with all of the long-term evidence-based practice implementation and how to keep things going. So, you know, because you get to the ridiculous point, <clears throat> you know, Bob Drake's an individual placement and support. <clears throat> Supportive employment, we all know how awesome that is, right? I think there are 21 randomized control trials. Show me the evidence, here's the evidence. People say they wanna work, I don't care if they stink, I don't care if their clothes are dirty. Help them get a job, and guess what happens? They start getting better, it's just true, right? 21 randomized control trials internationally, and Bob Drake still can't get every state in the United States for it to have a service line to support supported employment. We've got, we've got a lot of states on board, but not all of them. We'd rather spend money on day treatment. Why? It doesn't work. <laughs> Look what we got. <laughs> anyway, it's never just, it's, it's enough to make you pull your hair out sometimes because it's like we, we have the science that says do this. <laughs> it's not enough. It helps. It can help. Because one of the first things they say, I say when that, when that cognitive dissonance, when we introduce a recovery disruptive notion like Common ground, the cognitive dissonance sets in, and the first thing they want to know is, show me the evidence, and you do, and then they say, well, that's not my patient. <laughs> it won't work for my patient. All right. Other thoughts, questions? Yeah. Well, I'm urging, uh, I think there's always a place for training. There's always, what we need to concern ourselves with as trainers is the transfer to practice. Don't kid ourselves that training is enough, because it isn't. We need to really concern ourselves with the transfer into, into actual practice. And I'm proposing that one of the, th or I'm saying that the thing that I've learned uh, in order to make that transfer is develop tools that train as you use them. Tools that train as you use them. So I could stand up and lecture, and I have done grand rounds for psychiatrists more times than I can tell you. And, um, and they get inspired and perhaps they learn a little bit. But psychiatry, many psychiatrists in the public sector continue to practice in these 15-minute intervals 
in a way that a person doesn't have a chance to say something about their care and the psychiatrist is still dictating what, what uh, successful treatment happens. Just by creating a power statement, you disrupt that entire thing. And I could show you videos of psychiatrists saying how valuable power statements are to them. They've come to rely on power statements. As one of our docs said, um, I, can get, I can get from a power statement what might take me six months to understand about this person. He said, that's efficient, and I like that. That saves me time, and it helps me practice better. So that's the ticket. I mean, I think of, you know, um, so that's what I'm asking you to think about. What system, think of these little blocks and arrows, right? What system are you struggling with? And what's the point of disruption? So here's, let me just share with you, way in the beginning, when I was dreaming up the Common Ground program, okay, what was I thinking about? Well, I spent a year on the ground. Uh, I made 19 trips to the great state of Kansas, which is way out in the Midwest. Eight, 19 trips out in a year. And you know what I did the whole time? I shadowed psychiatrists in outpatient clinics and nurses. What do you do? I sat in on consults. I learned about their workflow. I was trying to understand their workflow. And there were certain themes that kept coming up. No more paperwork, no more paperwork, no more paperwork. I'm sick of computers. I want to talk to the person. Um, wouldn't it be great if some of the people that I was working with weren't so much bumps on logs and actually had something to say uh, during the appointment? Um, wouldn't it be great if people took the meds I prescribed for them? Uh, I learned a lot. I had to take the time in a non-judgmental way to hear what the um, uh, doctors were up to. But we want to disrupt, I think, not just what the doctors are doing, not just what the social workers are doing, but it's also important to disrupt what the patients or the clients are doing. Because what do patients do? What do clients do when they're in that role of client at a mental health center? I stand outside like a lump on a log and I smoke my cigarettes and I smoke my cigarettes and then I go in for my med appointment. Guess who sometimes protests about the Common Ground program? But I want to go outside and smoke my cigarette. Since when do I have to do this? What is the program disrupting for the clients? You can be active in your own recovery. You can have a voice and choice in your care. That's new. That's different. That's not the way it's been. Exactly. It's changed. <laughs> And we have adopted this in the agency as our standard of care. This is how we do it. This is how we do it. Just like when an agency, one of the examples we use all the time is when an agency decides to adopt an electronic health record, they don't go around and take a poll asking everybody if they're willing to do it. They say, this is how we do it. This is the way we do business. And we say the same thing with Common Ground. This is a different standard of care a higher standard of care, a person-centered standard of care. Let's do it. This is how we do it. Don't like the way we do standard of care here? There are plenty of other places you can go, but this is how we do it. People get on board. They definitely do. And I, other question, but part of the key is, is asking different questions than the same old question. So one of the questions that get asked all the time how are we going to change the psychiatrist? How are we going to change the psychiatrist? How are we going to get them to think different about recovery? And I said, I'm not going to get them to think different about recovery. I can't do that. <laughs> it's, I don't know how to do that. That's too hard. I don't know if anyone's got that right. I said, what's the different question I could ask myself? And here's what I came up with. There's this vast human resource sitting in waiting areas waiting for a long time sometimes, waiting. The question I asked is, how can I mobilize that human resource in the waiting room to drive change in what prescribers do? We're always asking, how do we change the psychiatrist? Well, I want to ask, how can we change the client who's asking different things of the psychiatrist? 
Because if there's one thing I know, is that the docs and the clinicians really care about the people coming for care. That that's what keeps them coming back to work. So that was my hypothesis. If I empower, if I activate, if I create the tools for people to go in with a very different expectation, that you're going to begin my appointment by reading my power statement back to me and asking, is this still our goal for treatment? That's how a, an appointment begins. Wow, I had forgotten that, oh yeah, it's about my baby and being a good mother. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Hey, you really know me. This is working. Let's keep going. So, that, so I'm encouraging you. Think of systems, not just groups of people. Ask very different questions, right? And then ask, what kind of tools could we use? And then sometimes people ask me, Pat, of all things, what you, <coughs> why are you trying to disrupt medication services? And I said, well, why, why not put all your energy into developing you know, more stuff for peer supporters and stuff? And I said, well, that's all well and good, I said, but I wanted to disrupt the system at the very heart of the system. In other words, where's the one place where pretty much everyone receiving services is going to end up at one point or another? About 100%, 99.9. Med clinic. That's where I want to be. Right there at ground zero so that I can get the message out there that recovery is possible and that medicine can be what you do, not just what you take, and that what matters to you is the goal of your care. It was that simple. That's why I went with med clinic. Now there might be some other place. Maybe it's your, the, the way your system is structured. I was reading a paper Max gave me about people <clears throat> using the uh, services basket. The so, that's the translation that I was reading. Anyway, yeah, and um, and it was great because uh, in, in Max's paper, there was an analysis of their findings. And uh, one of the things that came up is um, that some of the services that being, are being offered <clears throat> aren't necessarily what people want. And Max raises the question, well, maybe we should give people themselves the budget and let them say what help looks like. <laughs> A very radical idea. <laughs> very disruptive. Very transformative. Interesting. What are some of our other examples of that? What are some examples of that? So that's what I'm inviting you to have a look at uh, in this discussion period. Um, why don't you guys um, take some small group time and let me know what you come up with on this, okay? I'm very interested. Uh -huh.